Great. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think one of the, the challenges is that we were asked to prepare a, a visionary statement, and uh, but that's before we you know, had any of the great information we had over the past two days. So this represents sort of the blind man's visionary statement. <laughs> I think I learned, learned a lot more in the past day and a half that, that might contribute to something else. Um, just really briefly for people who don't know, I will give a, a, a less than one minute introduction. Africa CDC is a new public health agency of the African Union. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the African Union is analogous to the European Union. Um, it is the intergovernmental agency that represents all 55 countries on the African continent. Um, that's from Cairo to Cape Town. Um, and the African Union is, is dedicated to a vision uh, of a fully integrated and prosperous Africa. Um, and that means the, the realization of something that's just been ratified, which is a continental free trade agreement, meaning the free movement of goods, people, and services. And if you want the free movement of goods, people, and services across the continent, you need to have a health agency because, as we know, uh, humans will not just carry with them uh, themselves, but they'll also carry with them um, uh, diseases of all sorts. So um, I wanted to start by, you know, again, giving you that context so that you can understand, um, you know, a little bit where I'm coming from as sort of representing this from Africa. You know, what are these animating themes that we're, we're looking at on the African continent? Um, I think there are, are at least two um, uh, phrases that are worth, you know, uh, keeping emblazoned in your mind when you want to communicate with policymakers. Uh, these have resonance at the global stage and on the continent. Uh, those are universal health care um, and health security. So anytime we're talking about diseases or health challenges, we need to link it to those um, important concepts. Um, now, classically, the divide would be universal health care non-communicable diseases, health security, infectious diseases. But I think to the extent that we can promote these discussions, we can demonstrate how both of them belong within both areas. Um, I already started by mentioning that the theme of integration, um, this is critical to the vision of the AU. Um, it all extends from the, you know, sort of the, the colonial independence movement and the concept of pan-Africanism um, and the need for there to be a unified African voice. So this means having a continental free trade agreement. It means ultimately having a single African passport. Uh, it means having a single air transport market so that there can be transportation. Uh, you know, right now, if I want to fly from Addis to North Africa, I have to go through Europe. Uh, flying across West Africa uh, can be incredibly challenging. Um, and so part of realizing that is to go from integration is the creation of institutions. So the African Union has already created the Africa CDC, recently ratified in January at the, at the heads of state, annual heads of state meeting was the creation of a new African medicines agency. So if you're in the United States, this is analogous to the FDA. Um, and then we are committed to the creation of national public health institutes, CDC-like organizations in all 55 member states. Um, and finally, we need to focus on building infrastructure. Um, already, obviously, there is a lot of work in every country. Africa has some of the most fastest growing economies on, in the world. Um, but there is an, an intimate need to develop infrastructure that goes across um, countries and that promotes development across the continent, not just within individual countries. So um, when I was asked to prepare this statement, I think I am, you know, by training an internist, but uh, uh, by sort of philosophy and indoctrination, a public health person. Um, and so we like to think of things using this type of model, the public health impact pyramid. Um, so using this pyramid, um, you know, the, the, the interventions that have uh, the largest population impact, um, but also are... Um, you know, you know, and have the broadest impact across um, and also require the least amount of individual effort are those things at the bottom. Those are socioeconomic factors. That's, that's you know, pushing uh, development, uh, environmental structural change, the built environment, the human environment, et cetera. Um, the next is, you know, changing the context to make individual um, decisions um, that are by default healthy decisions. Um, this can be done through taxation, um, or, uh, through the direct banning of the availability of products. Let's say you're talking about trans fats. Um, the next would be what we consider long-lasting protective interventions. So these need to be delivered to individuals. So there's a lot more individual effort required, both on the health system side as well as the human side. But there are things like vaccines which obviously have long-lasting um, uh, impact and, and protect you. 
The next are clinical interventions, and this gets to a lot of the discussion we've been having. What are the models of care th that work? Um, the, the dilemma is, of course, you know, it, as a pyramid, you know, you're going to reach less of the population, and it requires a lot more individual effort. Um, and at the top of the pyramid are things like counseling and education. Um, so in the public health world, outside of the clinical world, we really try as much as possible to do things from the bottom up, things that can have an impact across the broadest population level and require the least change of individual human behavior or individual cognition to, to change how you think about things. So I wanted to use this pyramid just to introduce what I, what I had thought, again, before this, this conference happened, what I thought were sort of the most natural and easiest uh, you know, ways we can uh, pull together NCDs and, and communicable diseases. So the first was, again, starting at the top of the period, those things that are, uh, you know, require a fair amount of effort and reach the, low, you know, the lowest population would be um, doing the things that have been discussed here. How can we introduce chronic disease screening and control into vertical infectious disease programs? We already heard some examples about models for how you might be able to do this in HIV, which is probably the most well-funded and most built infrastructure for providing comprehensive clinical services to an individual. Um, so those are things that, that, that could be done fairly easily, but the dilemma is they're only going to you know, impact a, a smaller proportion of the population, and they, of course, require a tremendous amount of individual effort at the patient and the provider level. The next would be trying to look at ways that we can have long-lasting protective interventions. And this is where I think the most obvious introduction is. I mean, you know, really, I think, you know, the, the way we in the last 100 years have come to understand this intersection, for, intersection between chronic diseases and infectious diseases has really been with the original discovery that, um, you know, infectious diseases cause cancer. So we clearly have an enormous need to use vaccines that prevent cancer. Uh, the most obvious ones are hepatitis B vaccine and, hepatitis, and HPV vaccine, both of which are woefully underused. Hepatitis B vaccine, because it really should be delivered at birth um, to prevent perinatal transmission, and HPV vaccine, um, primarily because of, of the age of introduction, um, but also, of course, related to you know, lasting and enduring stigma about um, uh, sexual health and, and the prevention of, of, of sexually transmitted infections. The next would be to look at vaccines that may prevent um, cardiovascular death. One of the things that was missing from this meeting that I thought would have been interesting would have been to learn more about um, the role of seasonal influenza vaccination in the prevention of cardiovascular morbidity and the prevention of, of, of precipitating uh, DKA. Um, and the next would be even more effortful would be drugs that can be used to prevent cancer. Um, so we know that hepatitis C is now something that can be cured even more easily than tuberculosis. Uh, yet again, represents a huge divide within the infectious disease world uh, between, say, HIV and hepatitis C. And I think presents an interesting model for why we prioritize some diseases over others. Um, but this is a, a clear, easy win um, to reduce deaths from, from liver cancer. Um, we also didn't talk really about H. pylori and the role that this might play, treatment of it in the prevention of um, gastrointestinal, particularly gastric cancer. Um, and then the next step down I wanted to get to was the issue of, you know, how do we change the default to make decisions healthy? And I think that one of the, the very clear intersections, one of the areas that we're working on um, related to this animating theme of universal health care is making sure that universal health care is also high quality care. So, you know, you start with, over in this end, you start with quality, um, a subset of quality is patient safety, and a subset of patient safety is infection prevention. So we are working to try to uh, to build uh, durable uh, um, changes related to infection prevention and cold, primarily through advocacy on public health laws related to the regulation of safe healthcare facilities and standards for their regulation. While this has a very clear benefit for health security, it has a much lasting benefit in the sense that it can build the infrastructure. If you can prevent infections and build an, an antimicrobial stewardship program, you should be able to build a patient safety program, which means you are on the continuum to providing quality of care. Um, and so I think this is a very natural way in which we can have a durable change in the health system that benefits both infectious as well as non-infectious um, diseases. 
I also think, you know, another model for how we look at, at public health is to focus on surveillance. So that is the, how do you detect how many people in a population actually have a disease? And I think, again, related to the areas which are, which are most easy to, to grab right now, um, I think one is cancer registries. And I think that's because we have vaccines, as we said, to prevent cancer. Um, and these are underutilized throughout the continent. Um, what, what registries do exist have low coverage, then there's a limited connection between the data being collected and national level public health policy related to screening for malignancies, prevention of malignancies, and then of course access to oncology treatment. Um, and by developing these cancer registries better, we can really have a better understanding of the burden and also build the case both for the prevention of cancer through vaccines that target pathogens, but also to the entry point to the control and treatment of these diseases in the non-communicable sphere. The next is to think about genomic intelligence. And actually, it's interesting, when I, when I was thinking about this, I was only thinking about pathogens, and now I'm thinking more about microbiome and you know, commensal flora. Um, we at Africa CDC are working on trying to figure out and build an, a, a continent-wide infrastructure for pathogen genomic intelligence. So how do you take, um, instead of just focusing only on the diagnosis of, 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 of pathogens um, through culture or, or rapid methods, but how do you type them? and then use that genetic information for a whole host of things, from clinical decision making to outbreak control to vaccine design. Um, and so this is an enormous area that I think will help create an architecture to also integrate you know, human genomic you know, genomics into medicine. You know, in the Western developed world, we're all focused on precision medicine. There should be a way to eventually get there if we can build the infrastructure now um, in Africa. So I'll stop right there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you.